Welcome to the DVD Shelf Movie Reviews. Where movies are celebrated, not incinerated. Yes, sir. Hi, I'd like some breakfast. We stop serving breakfast at 11.30. Rick, have you ever heard the expression, the customer is always right? Yeah. Yeah, well, here I am, the customer. That's not our policy. You have to order something from the lunch menu. I don't want lunch. I want breakfast. Yeah, well, hey, I'm really sorry. Yeah, well, hey, I'm really sorry, too. Get a gun! Let's get organized! Calm down. Just calm down, everybody. Just sit down. Sit down over there. Hey, 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 hey. Take it easy. Okay, so he isn't having the best day. Michael Douglas plays Bill Foster, a former government worker who just kinda snaps one day, or so it would seem. On a relentlessly hot morning, Foster abandons his car in the middle of a traffic jam and begins trekking across the dangerous streets of downtown Los Angeles. Foster's exceedingly aggressive personality begins to reveal itself through a series of random encounters which leave behind a mysterious trail of violence and destruction that catches the attention of an aging police detective played by Robert Duvall. Was Bill Foster merely the victim of an isolated nervous breakdown, or has his sanity, much like the world around him, slowly been falling down? I'm your host, David Rose, and today, we're digging deep into the 1993 psychological crime thriller, Falling Down. I'll kick off today's show by giving a little historical insight into why this controversial film seemed to hit all the right notes when it was released in the early 90s. I'll be analyzing some of the movie's notorious themes and ideas while dissecting the intricate character traits of Bill Foster, who was brought to life by Michael Douglas's chilling and at times funny performance. Then I'll cap it all off with my final recommendation of the film's Blu-ray and special features. But that's not all. As an added bonus, I'll briefly discuss a handful of other films, old and new, that I see as companion pieces to Falling Down, with each one featuring a gun-toting anti-hero navigating what he perceives to be a broken society. Plus, by adding in unique blends of social commentary and satire, you're left with some pretty interesting snapshots of their respective time periods that are all thematically similar to today's main feature. Speaking of which, it looks like we've got a lot on our plate today. So, let's go ahead and pull the trigger on Falling Down. Directed by Joel Schumacher and starring Michael Douglas, Robert Duvall, Barbara Hershey, Rachel Ticketon, Frederick Forrest, and Tuesday Weld. It was released theatrically by Warner Brothers Pictures on February 26, 1993. The original DVD was released on October 26, 1999. The reissued Deluxe Edition DVD and the Blu-ray with special Digibook packaging were both released on May 26, 2009, and the Blu-ray and Standard packaging was released later on November 16, 2010. In late April of 1992, the city of Los Angeles, California looked like a war zone, and in a way it was. On April 29th, the LA County Superior Court found four local police officers not guilty of assault charges and excessive force that was used against 25-year-old construction worker Rodney King, who was pulled over on the night of March 3rd, 1991, after leading police on an extended highway chase while driving under the influence. Homemade video evidence of King's severe beating and tasering by the officers instantly became an international headline, making Rodney King a household name. Once the officers were relieved of the charges on April 29, 1992, the swift public response was nothing short of chaotic as all hell broke loose across the LA area. The tense racial undertones of the incident, trial, and eventual verdict led to a six-day-long series of riots across the city that included looting, arson, and even group beatings of random citizens. Even though the riots were considered officially over by May 4th, pockets of violence continued to occur, and once it was all said and done, 53 people were dead, over 2,000 were injured, and the city of Los Angeles was now sitting in over $1 billion worth of property damage. By pure happenstance, a new movie that was currently filming locally in the LA area had literally finished shooting right as these riots were at their peak, and as it turned out, this very film was Falling Down, a socially aware dramatic thriller that tackled some of the same hot-button issues that were currently ripping L.A. apart. Its star, Michael Douglas, recounts his memories of rapping production on the movie. 
you know, one of my strongest memories that I'll, I'll never forget was literally finishing up the movie over in the San Fernando Valley, and the riots were in full bloom, and plumes of smoke across the city that were progressing towards the west side from downtown LA. When I got my family, I said, well, I think we should get out of here. So we went to the airport, I remember driving to the airport, across the mountains and looking out over the city you saw these fires going all over and sort of shaking my head and thinking how amazingly appropriate this film was at this time. Seven years I banked in. You know what they told me to ask for a loan? A small loan. They told me that I was not economically viable. I always thought that this picture was closer to the pulse than, than we thought in terms of the kind of tensions that existed at that time. Don't forget me. The LA riots occurred at a point in American history where the Cold War may have been over, but a cultural civil war was on the rise. And because such large urban areas like Los Angeles and New York City are so ethnically diverse, they tend to make ideal settings for films that aren't afraid to tackle such issues of race and class warfare. In fact, it was around this time, 1989 to be exact, that filmmaker Spike Lee wrote, directed, and starred in what is still likely considered his most famous film, Do the Right Thing, an exploration of the heated relationships between various ethnic groups living and working together in a confined Brooklyn neighborhood. Then why don't you move back to Massachusetts? I was born in Brooklyn. Oh! Do the Right Thing wasn't afraid to use an honest mix of drama and humor to exhibit why this grab bag of colorful characters just couldn't get along. And as these racial tensions pile up throughout the film, they violently erupt in a finale that even to this very day continues to generate discussion. Do the Right Thing became so popular and so talked about that it firmly established Spike Lee as an acclaimed and gutsy filmmaker. The movie's two Oscar nominations didn't hurt either. Doctor? Come on, what, what? Always do the right thing. That's it? That's it. I got it. I'm gone. The success of Do the Right Thing no doubt inspired the productions of other socially relevant dramatic works, and I wouldn't be surprised if it also had a slight influence on writer Ebby Rose Smith, who penned the screenplay for Falling Down. It's not quite as racially driven as Do the Right Thing is, but when a Los Angeles set film spends its time commenting on society and culture, these issues tend to come up. It may have been following in the footsteps of other socially conscious fictional works, but it's the real world subject matter that truly makes Falling Down a product of its time. Falling Down sets up the city of Los Angeles as being one of the main characters, but it sure isn't trying to be flattering in its depiction. There's a raw nature to the city in this movie that I think is only enhanced by the cinematography, which uses a very warm color palette to emulate the look of a truly hot and sticky day. Not unlike how Do the Right Thing's extremely saturated photography shoves the scorching inner city heat right in your face. The almost rundown look of the city, as authentic as it may be, is such an important aspect because of how it visually represents the social and economic deterioration that continuously infuriates Michael Douglas's Bill Foster character, and it almost seems by design that the city's decaying look mirrors Foster's crumbling state of mind. Up until recently, Bill Foster was your typical family man and a highly educated white-collar weapons engineer for a local defense plant, but due to post-Cold War downsizing, Foster was suddenly laid off. In some clips of his old home movies, we catch brief glimpses of his white-hot temper, which contributed to his wife divorcing him, throwing him out of the house, and filing a restraining order. By now, his mental capacity had reached its breaking point, where even his own mother, whom he's been currently living with, is terrified by his unpredictable behavior. However, at the very start of the film, we know nothing about his character. All we know that this guy is stuck in an endless traffic jam on an exceptionally hot day with no working air conditioning, which is a pet peeve for many of us. So what does he do? He lives out a fantasy I think a lot of us has had in this situation. He simply abandons his car with no regard for the possible legal ramifications and just walks away. He then sets off on a 20 mile journey across the gritty LA landscape, occasionally mentioning along the way that he's just trying to get home, which we soon learn means that he's walking to his old house for his daughter's birthday party, and due to the periodic harassing phone calls he makes to his wife, we're led to assume the worst for his family. 
What follows is an almost episodic series of little adventures where we see Foster interacting with random citizens of differing ethnicities and walks of life. And through these encounters, we start to realize that this man is a bit unbalanced, yet still compelling to watch. Foster is a man who was clearly shaped by the world that surrounds him, and after spending most of his life knowing the rules, he's grown tired of playing by them. This is my golf course. If I want to play here, I will play Nobody here. You understand? Said. If he gets hit with my title list, that's his fucking problem. Don't yell at me. I'm just here playing with you, for Christ's sake. Catch the ball. You want to Four! Hit? Five! Foster is insanely fascinating to watch because just when you think you might have his character pegged, the story veers off in a completely different direction. It's a fiercely calculating character study that takes its time in peeling back all the layers of Foster's backstory, motivations, and emotions, and you almost feel manipulated into wondering whether or not Foster's actions are, at times, justifiable. From the beginning, Foster isn't just some one-note psychopath, but instead a kinda relatable character who observes, ponders, and complains about the little things that tend to irk all of us from time to time. And in doing so, he ends up making some pretty good points. It's like the classic comic book idea, where the supervillain truly believes he's doing the right thing, but I think simply labeling Foster the villain is missing the point. Thankfully, the film doesn't become some sort of propaganda by making his motivations politically driven, which is refreshing considering how obsessed the United States can be with trying to shoehorn every little belief or opinion into the confines of one party or the other. It's more like Foster is seeing things a bit too clearly in a world he feels has gone mad, which is what makes him worth rooting for at times. But ultimately, the movie doesn't completely condone his actions, and by the end of the picture, there's one simple line he says that pretty much sums everything up. I'm the bad guy? Yeah. How'd that happen? The scenes in Falling Down that always stood out to me would be when Foster takes a time out to monologue about some of life's hypocrisies and frustrations, giving the film an occasional injection of dark humor. What are you doing to the street? We're fixing it! What the hell does it look like? Two days ago it was fine. You telling me the street fell apart in two days? Well, I guess so. Pardon me, but that's bullshit. Turn around, look at that. You see what I mean? It's, it's plump, it's juicy, it's three inches thick. Look at this sorry, miserable, squashed thing. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this picture? Sometimes it's the most trivial things in our own lives that really set us off, especially when they start to pile up over the course of one bad day. So it's almost cathartic to watch Foster take out his frustrations in such over-the-top ways. However, there is one very important point about the Bill Foster character that tends to get overlooked in regards to the violence he commits. He may be a bit psychotic and not all that politically correct, but he still seems to have this sort of loose moral code where he doesn't really want to hurt or kill anybody unless he's provoked, like he's doing it out of self-defense. In fact, defense is one of the strongest thematic elements throughout the entire film, right down to the fact that Foster was a former federal defense employee and is even given the nickname Defense by the police due to the vanity license plate on his abandoned vehicle. There's no denying that Foster instigates many tense situations, but not once does he get truly dangerous until he himself is feeling threatened, especially when he crosses paths with a hate-fueled, extremely racist and homophobic neo-Nazi owner of an army surplus store. Next to this guy, Foster's looking pretty level-headed, and I think the movie's deliberate inclusion of this absolutely despicable supporting character brings us back into Foster's corner at a time in the movie where we're really not sure what to think of him. What kind of vigilante are you? I am not a vigilante. I am just trying to get home to my little girl's birthday. And if everybody will stay out of my way, then nobody will get hurt. Fuck you! Who the fuck are you? Are you fucking with me? I am You're just disagreeing with, with you! In America, we have the freedom of speech, the right to disagree! Fuck you and your freedom! Who the fuck are you? Now, of course, the film doesn't shy away from the fact that once Foster reaches his family, it's not unlikely that he might do something horrible to them due to his psychosis. But the film has a way of keeping that supposed intention in the background and practically ambiguous. Now, obviously, there's a lot involved here when it comes to describing the morally complex Bill Foster. And having your lead character walk that fine line between hero and villain is a pretty ballsy creative decision you don't usually find in a mainstream movie produced by a major studio. Look out!
Foster doesn't operate in typical, easy-to-grasp, black-and-white movie logic. There are a lot of real-world gray areas at play here that border on being politically incorrect, and sure, those ideas originate from the script, but I think the success of Falling Down comes, first and foremost, from Michael Douglas's hypnotic performance. Douglas steps into Bill Foster's shoes with a certain grace. The eerie calmness to his personality constantly keeps you on edge and always unsure when he's going to erupt. Foster is a force of nature. It's as if the guy doesn't truly exist. Like an apparition, he just slips from place to place, leaving havoc in his wake, but continues to calmly walk away without getting caught. And I think some of the humor in the film comes from the fact that he gets away with so much. For a while, at least. Personally, I think it's easily one of Douglas's best performances I've seen. And even he's called it some of his best work, so I guess you can't argue with that. Around this time, Douglas was starring in a string of erotic thrillers like Fatal Attraction, Basic Instinct, and Disclosure, and had also won an Oscar in 1987 for his performance in Oliver Stone's Wall Street. But still, I think seeing Douglas look and act in a movie like this would have been quite a change of pace at the time. He can play a great scumbag, but his role in Falling Down called for something a bit more textured and immersive, both in demeanor and in physical appearance. There's just something so striking, menacing, and iconic about Douglas's look in the film, which I think still holds up today because it is so simple, and somewhat outdated, even by 1993 standards. At first glance, he just looks like your average working class guy in a plain white collar shirt and black tie, but that rather plain image is elevated a bit by a militaristic flat top crew cut and a vintage pair of 1950s style brow line frame glasses that come across like he stepped right out of the Cold War. It's as if, through his appearance alone, the movie is saying that Bill Foster belongs to a different time, back when a hard-working, patriotic family man like him was the model American citizen. And that notion becomes even clearer when he says it himself. I lost my job. Actually, I didn't lose it. Uh, it lost me. I'm overeducated, underskilled. Maybe it's the other way around, I forget. And I'm obsolete. I'm not economically viable. Aside from Douglas, Falling Down rounds up an equally strong supporting cast headlined by the great Robert Duvall as Martin Prendergast, a likable police detective who's just one day away from retirement. Ah yes, that old trope. Ah, oh, you know how it is with cops. I'll get shot three days before retirement. In the business, we call it retirene. It's one of the oldest plot tricks in the book. The hero who's tragically killed in the line of duty just before he's about to quit or retire from his job and go live out the rest of his life in peace. I'm sure you've seen it a million times before, whether used genuinely or in parody. You know, when we get back home, I'm retired from the revolution. Start a family. That's better, Joe. Yeah. Raise own fruits and vegetables. Back on bread. You know what I mean? Back on. <laughs> Who saw that come? Who saw where that came from? Let's go. It can be an overused cliche in most cases, and in Falling Down, Robert Duvall's character arc just so happens to be drenched in this idea. But I think it actually works in this particular instance because it isn't used in just some cheap way to establish emotional weight in a background character who has, say, five minutes of screen time. Prendergast's last day before he decides to quit the police force has him entangled in Bill Foster's crimes, all the while his co-workers constantly make jokes and refer to the irony of it being his last day on the job. And because this film fully embraces it as one of his defining characteristics, I think it cleverly subverts the viewer's expectations of what they think will happen to Prendergast by the end. Now I think director Joel Schumacher has crafted a brilliant little movie here, and it's astounding to think that this was released only two years before he went off to direct his two notoriously hated Batman movies, because there couldn't be any more contrast between the two styles. Schumacher gets a little too much flack these days simply for what he did to Batman, but the guy has made other films too, some of them that are pretty damn good. So to write off his entire filmography is to overlook some pretty strong movie making, and to me, Falling Down is easily one of his best efforts. Now that's impressive! While his two Batman movies were brimming with neon colors, awful one-liners, cool party, incoherent storytelling and ridiculous acting, Falling Down is dark, gritty, damn near perfectly acted, and has one thing Schumacher's Batman movies completely lacked. Subtlety. Good night. To be fair, 
Schumacher's Batman movies were mainly the product of Warner Brothers wanting to make the franchise lighter, brighter, and more family-friendly after director Tim Burton angered parents with his bile-spewing penguin and dominatrix Catwoman. So it's pretty evident that Schumacher simply did what the studio forced him to do. We actually came close to getting a third Batman movie out of Schumacher who had wanted to bring Batman back to his darker roots, and Falling Down is a pretty clear indicator that Schumacher can put together a great movie about a disturbed vigilante dealing out his own brand of justice in a grimy urban nightmare. Needless to say, the release of Falling Down did not come without controversy. Some early test screenings were even met with threats of boycotting, but these kinds of talks tend to make the public even more curious about a movie, and for its first two weekends of release in early 1993, Falling Down came in number one at the box office. The final gross of $40.9 million was nothing really special for a major studio film budgeted at around $25 million, but the film has gained quite a following over the years due to home media and constant TV play, and even though some of the movie's ideas are a bit dated now, overall there are so many aspects to it that still hold up so well today. At the time of its release, the film was called out for being mainly two things, violent and racist. But what's kind of funny though is if you actually pay attention to the film's context, it isn't really either of those things, at least the way I see it. When it comes to the violence, it's very light when compared to so many other movies out there, especially ones made these days. But people tend to overreact a little bit more when a movie's trying to be more realistic with its violence, as opposed to the ridiculousness seen in your typical slasher flick or something. Now when it comes to being racist, I just think that's an easy label to place on a film like this. Korean and Hispanic activists were angered by the film's depiction of these minority groups, and I suppose I can see why, but there's a certain way the movie handles these more racially driven scenes where I think calling them flat out racist is missing the point. The main idea this movie is trying to get across is how miscommunication between different ethnicities can often lead to a sense of social alienation, and this idea is fleshed out in the sequences where language barriers escalate the anger between Foster and some of the other characters. You're trespassing on private property. Trespassing. Loitering too, man. That's right, you're loitering too. I didn't see any signs. What you call that? Graffiti? No, man. That's not fucking graffiti. That's a sign. He can't read it, man. I'll read it for you. It says this is fucking private property. No fucking trespassing. This means fucking you. Says all that? Yeah! Well, maybe he wrote it in fucking English, I could fucking understand it. So, I guess if you want to call that racism, then I think the movie fairly shows it coming from all sides, not just from the angry white male perspective. In fact, if you tally it up, the majority of the characters portrayed negatively in the film are actually white. We're the same, you and me. We're the same, don't you see? We are not the same. I'm an American. You're a sick asshole. Over the years, Falling Down has been referenced multiple times in popular culture. The movie, or specifically the character of Bill Foster, was the focus of the 1995 song Man on the Edge, written and performed by heavy metal rock band Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden? Excellent! <laughs> later saw the initial airing of what has since become arguably one of the most beloved and certainly darkest episodes of The Simpsons, where we're introduced to a new employee at the Springfield nuclear power plant named Frank Grimes, a man who spent his entire life taking his work very seriously and has faced some rather difficult obstacles to get where he is today. God, I've had to work hard every day of my life, and what do I have to show for it? This briefcase and this haircut! but he will soon suffer a complete mental breakdown after being hired on to work alongside who else but Homer Simpson. Chair goes round, chair goes round. And not only does Frank Grimes' physical appearance scream Bill Foster, but so does his complete intolerance for Homer's buffoonish antics and the fact that his life has been nothing but one constant string of misfortunes. <laughs> you idiot! You nearly drank a beaker full of sulfuric acid! Yesterday, gee, 
That would have been stupid. <laughs> Stop laughing, you imbecile! Who did this to my wool? He did. Is this true? I, well, uh, I, technically it is true, sir, but... Come with me. He likes you. More recently, the music video for the 2011 Foo Fighters song entitled Walk is clearly parodying several key scenes from Falling Down, where the band's lead singer and guitarist, Dave Grohl, dresses in quite the familiar getup. So to close out this part of our journey into madness, let's look at the Blu-ray for Falling Down, which fortunately includes two insightful supplemental features. Joel Schumacher and Michael Douglas both provide some of their own thoughts on the film in a great audio commentary, and in a special retrospective interview, Douglas looks back on the making of Falling Down and its cultural impact. The disc also includes the film's theatrical trailer. Having watched Falling Down quite a few times over the years, I always seem to pick up on new things, which is a testament to how layered and thought-provoking it is. I think it's one of those movies that can leave a different impression on you depending on your mood, but it's a lasting impression regardless. It's an entertaining film I like to revisit every once in a while, and because of its engrossing story, great acting, and genuine touches of observational comedy, I came this close to giving it a 5 out of 5 disc recommendation, but because Falling Down probably isn't for everyone's taste, I'm going to have to settle on a heavy 4 out of 5 disc recommendation. Buy it if you run across it. I think we have a critic. <laughs> well, that about wraps up my main review. But you're welcome to stick around while I recommend some other films similar to Falling Down that I think you might enjoy. But you don't have to take my word for it. Wait a minute. Y yes, you do. This is, this is my show. Of course you have to take my word for it. Now, Falling Down was neither the first movie, nor was it the most recent to feature average Joes turned gun-toting anti-heroes who take it upon themselves to right what they see wrong with the world around them. Some call them vigilantes, others might just call them crazy. But what all these deranged figures have in common is that their stories somehow get you to rally behind them by using unique blends of social commentary and satire to justify their grisly actions. Each one of the following films was created in response to their respective time periods and cultural climates. So now that we've examined Falling Down's portrait of early 90s Los Angeles, I'm going to take a quick break before introducing you to six more controversial madmen that share a common belief in violence being society's best medicine. You like it? Yeah, it's all right. Kicking off this list, it's free love versus the working class as seen way back during the height of the hippie revolution with the great Peter Boyle playing a blue collar bigot named Joe. Why work? You tell me why the fuck work when you can screw, have babies and get paid for it? A lot of good my education did me. And then I use the money to, to buy booze. Nobody has a right to booze unless he earns the money. It ought to be a law. You don't work, you don't drink. And the poor kids and the middle class kids, they're all copying the rich kids. They're all going the same goddamn screw America way. Hippies. Joe. Joe, do me a favor. Give us all a break. Peter Boyle plays Joe Curran, a racist and loudmouth factory worker who befriends a successful businessman with a dirty little secret, and helps him search for his missing drug addict daughter, after she decides to run off with a band of free-spirited hippie burnouts. For those of us who weren't around during the late 60s, early 70s, a lot of our knowledge about the hippie culture likely stems from the historical imagery that came out of the three-day Woodstock Music Festival, or the seemingly never-ending protests against the Vietnam War. To many, this time period was defined by psychedelic clothing, acid rock music, and flower children. But in actuality, that was only one side of the story. Nowadays, classic movies like Easy Rider, Billy Jack, and Yellow Submarine are considered iconic pieces of hippie-era filmmaking. But then, another film came along that focused on the older generation the hippie movement was rebelling against. And that film was simply called Joe. Released in 1970, Joe presents this huge generation gap through the eyes of two working-class guys. Joe, the blue-collar factory worker, and Bill Compton, the white-collar businessman who immediately bond over their common distaste for hippie youth. Kids. <laughs> they are taking over the culture. The what? The culture. The movies, books, clothes, music. Yeah, yeah. They're all screwed up, so they got control of the culture, right? They're all screwed up, so they're screwing up the culture. Yeah, it ain't what the kids say that we screwed them up. It's the other way around. It's the kids who are screwing us up. 
Am I right? Oh, yes, of course. Oh, fucking A. This film doesn't glorify the hippie lifestyle like you see in a lot of period pieces made these days about the 60s, but rather portrays them as uncivilized junkies who do nothing but lie around all day, do drugs, and partake in what Joe comically mispronounces as orgies. For all my life, I ain't never been to an orgy. This is an orgy, isn't it? To Joe and Bill, hippies are completely foreign creatures, and some of the film's of-the-time cultural differences and observations are as funny as they are intriguing to watch. A young Susan Sarandon made her feature film debut here as Bill's strung-out hippie daughter Melissa, and Bill was played by character actor Dennis Patrick, but it's the always great Peter Boyle who really shines as the title character. Unlike Bill Foster in Falling Down, the movie doesn't dance around Joe's racism, which the movie naturally caught a lot of flack for, but what Joe Curran and Bill Foster do have in common is, in a nutshell, their aggressive hostility towards disrespectful assholes. You need help. Sick. Was well, he sick? Take a walk around this town. That's sick. These kids, they shit on you. They shit on your life. They shit on everything you believe in. They shit on everything. Towards the end of the movie, Joe hunts down a commune full of hippies who have stolen his money, and now that the youth culture he's always despised has affected him directly, he finally loses it and snaps in one hell of a chilling finale. At the time, Joe was extremely controversial where many people had issues with its language and supposed glorifying of gun violence. While watching the film for the first time with a public audience, Peter Boyle was horrified when they started cheering for Joe as he proceeded to kill the hippies with one of his prized shotguns. Boyle fully expected the audience to see Joe as a monster, but like Bill Foster, there was just something about him that made people see him as the hero of the story. In fact, a mere 10 weeks before Joe was even released in theaters, a man by the name of Arville Douglas Garland shot up a hippie dormitory in Detroit, Michigan, including his own teenage daughter and a group of her friends, which is eerily similar to the climax of Joe. Now, it would have been impossible to accuse the movie for inspiring the massacre since it hadn't been released yet, but like audiences rallying behind Joe's actions, parents nationwide actually took Garland's side, where he received hundreds of sympathy letters while serving his time in prison. Following Joe's theatrical release and box office success, Norman Wexler's screenplay was nominated for an Academy Award, the film's director John G. Avildsen would go on to direct more mainstream blockbuster hits like Rocky and the Karate Kid, and it's even been said that the character of Joe Curran went on to inspire the creation of iconic working-class bigot Archie Bunker from the classic 70s sitcom All in the Family. It's not uncommon that Archie Bunker has been compared to Peter Boyle's Frank Barone character from Everybody Loves Raymond, and now, I'm sure you can see why. Holy crap! Even though parts of Joe are quite dated now, the film's raw and extremely low-budget nature continues to make for an interesting watch, not just for historical reasons, but also for Peter Boyle's outstanding performance. There's only one way out now. Clean. That means everybody. At this point, it can get to be fun. And speaking of Peter Boyle, he also shows up as a supporting character in our next offering that's touted as being one of the most influential psychological thrillers in cinema history. Can I ask you something, Travis? Sure. What is the one thing about this country that bugs you the most? Well, whatever it is, you should clean up this city here because this city here is like an open sewer, you know? It's full of filth and scum. Whatever ever becomes the president should just really clean it up. You know what I mean? Sometimes I go out and I smell it, I get headaches, it's so bad, you know? It's like, I think that the president should just clean up this whole mess here. He should just flush it right down the fucking toilet. Well, uh, I think I know what you mean, Travis. But it's not gonna be easy. We're gonna have to make some radical changes. Sam straight. Robert De Niro turns in a career-defining performance as Travis Bickle, a quiet, lonely man who went off to fight in the Vietnam War and in many ways, never came back. To deal with his relentless insomnia, Bickle begins working the graveyard shift as a taxi driver, never expecting his late-night excursions through New York City would lead him into its darkest and dirtiest corners, and the more he's exposed to what's going on around him, the more we become privy to what this mentally troubled figure is truly capable of. 
director Martin Scorsese's 1976 film noir masterpiece, Taxi Driver, perfectly captures a time of American bleakness and uncertainty following the end of the Vietnam War, which is visually characterized by the film's authentically grungy urban grit. This is New York City as seen purely through the eyes of Travis Bickle. And we know this because De Niro is present in nearly every single scene, and even provides the occasional voiceover narration. We follow every step of Bickle's constant downward spiral, which feels hauntingly natural due to the film's deliberately slow pace. A true method actor through and through, De Niro famously lost a fair amount of weight to play the wiry Travis Bickle, and also worked several weeks at a real New York taxicab service to get a feel for the job. As Falling Down was about a disturbed, ill-tempered man shaped by a rotten society, Taxi Driver helped set that standard by being an earlier example of exploring the minute details of what can cause an unstable person to fly off the handle. Whether it's a young Sybil Shepherd playing the object of his obsessive desire, a 13-year-old Jodie Foster as an underage prostitute he feels the need to rescue, or the endless parade of scum who sits in the backseat of his taxicab, the film provides plenty of triggers for Bickle's dark and deadly thoughts, which he mulls over with a fellow cabbie played by Peter Boyle. The way I see it, Bickle isn't a very relatable main character, although I'm sure back when the film came out in 1976, many fully embraced him as an angry voice of their generation. Regardless of whether or not today's viewers who are watching this film for the first time look at Bickle the same way, it's still a memorable experience witnessing his seamless metamorphosis from a reclusive taxi driver to a crazed, mohawk-wearing vigilante. Out of all the movies on this list, Taxi Driver has probably faced the most controversy over the years, predominantly in 1981 when it was accused of directly inspiring a failed assassination attempt on President Ronald Reagan at the hands of lone gunman John Hinckley Jr. Hinckley famously stated that he did it to impress Jodie Foster, whom he'd become infatuated with from watching her in Taxi Driver. Accusers point to a sequence in the film where Travis Bickle seeks to assassinate a senator at a political rally, but flees the scene when he realizes he's being watched. Naturally, the film has since become synonymous with the Reagan assassination attempt and has sparked plenty of discussion over whether or not entertainment instigates real-world violence. Before its theatrical release in 1976, the Motion Picture Association of America nearly slapped Taxi Driver with an X rating due to its violent content. You might watch this film nowadays and wonder what all the fuss was about, especially since it isn't really that violent until its famous blood-soaked climax, but in order for director Martin Scorsese to achieve his R rating, he heavily desaturated the color in the violent shootout to mute the bright red blood. This explains why the sequence looks so different from the rest of the movie. Although because these scenes stand out from the rest, debate continues over whether Bickle's carnage actually happened or was it all in his head an ambiguity that has since become a bit of a cliché in psychological dramas. So if you're a fan of these kinds of movies, but you've never experienced Taxi Driver, you should probably fix that. You talking to me? Next up, we're fast-forwarding all the way to 2008, where American icon Clint Eastwood directs and stars in the highly talked about drama, Gran Torino. What the hell did Shinx have to move into this neighborhood for? Eastwood portrays the gruff Walt Kowalski, an old embittered widower, Korean War veteran, and retired Ford Motors assembly line worker who feels completely alienated from his family and the ever-changing world around him. Much of Kowalski's bitterness comes from decades of watching his neighborhood being overtaken by lower-class Asian immigrants and frequent gang violence. Never one to crack a smile, Kowalski's only remaining artifact from the life he once enjoyed is his prized 1972 Ford Grand Torino that he built himself decades ago while working at Ford. One day Kowalski stops one of the local Hmong immigrants from stealing his vintage car and nearly kills him in the process. After the boy's failure leads to him getting attacked by the gang members who pressured him into stealing it in the first place, Kowalski inadvertently rescues him when demanding that everyone is to stay off his property. By saving the boy from the gang, Kowalski earns the respect of his Hmong neighbors, a respect he doesn't plan on reciprocating anytime soon. Even though this film is only five years old, there's a genuine, old-fashioned sensibility to it. And I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way. 
Due to its blatant racism and deliberate disregard for political correctness, Gran Torino is a film that's next to impossible to make these days. And what impressed me the most about it is what director and star Clint Eastwood doesn't shy away from. He bluntly and consistently spews out racial slurs throughout a lot of the film because, well, that's just how his character is. The whole point of the movie's setup is to show his unbridled resentment towards his neighbors, and the dialogue surely doesn't pull any punches. But I think because his character is nearing his 80s, the film gets away with it because, like it or not, a lot of people around his age did and still do talk like that. Plus, the film goes the extra mile to mention some traumatic events he suffered during his service in the Korean War, which may have instilled much of his misplaced hate towards minority groups. Now, I personally see the points the film is making, and I understand that means some political correctness is going to have to be sacrificed. Not that I advocate it, but people who nonchalantly throw around racial slurs is just something that exists in this world, and Gran Torino sets out to study a person like that without watering anything down. Yet despite how off-putting Kowalski can be, the film eventually does turn him into a redeeming character. Although I suppose audiences weren't too turned off by him considering Gran Torino ended up being the most financially successful film of Eastwood's long career. In fact, I even remember hearing rumors during the film's production that it was secretly going to be a long-awaited sequel in the famed Dirty Harry series, and with the way Clint Eastwood portrays Walt Kowalski, I can see why people would see it as a spiritual extension of that franchise. But Gran Torino is certainly going for something with a little more dramatic weight to it. Now, out of all the movies I'm discussing, Gran Torino is easily the most racially driven, and much like Falling Down, it takes place in a melting pot community ravaged by violence and intolerance, this time in Detroit instead of LA. Falling Down and Gran Torino were made 15 years apart, which paints a pretty discouraging picture of how some things in our society just never change, if not worsen. While the characters of Bill Foster and Walt Kowalski are very different, similarities between the two are evident, like how they both fearlessly confront gang violence head-on, how they feel the average hard-working white guy just can't catch a break anymore, and how they both desperately cling on to relics of their once happier lives. For Bill Foster, it's his family, and for Walt Kowalski, it's his vintage Ford Gran Torino. Both films have been criticized for how they portray different ethnicities and walks of life. When Falling Down was released, viewers were upset that Hispanics were portrayed as thuggish gang members, and the Korean convenience store owner made Koreans look angry and high-strung, not to mention making shop owners look like price gougers. Take the money! You think I'm a thief? No. See, I'm not the thief. I'm not the one charging 85 cents for a stinking soda! You're the thief! Even actual former defense employees were upset at the film for making it look like every laid-off defense worker was going to go on a killing spree. Likewise, Gran Torino was similarly criticized for racial generalization, along with some inaccurate and exaggerated depictions of the Hmong culture. Damn barbarians. I'll agree that it can be a slippery slope when movies try and comment on different races because audiences are quick to accuse a movie of stereotyping an entire race or culture when only a few characters from a certain group are portrayed in a negative light. But if you focus on that, you're missing the points of both Gran Torino and Falling Down, neither of which are trying to be documentaries, by the way. I see them more as parables that are reflecting real-world problems to tell their stories, and when done right, movies like these can convey very strong underlying moral and social messages despite some parties accusing them of being distasteful. Now what I find to be just as interesting as watching these kinds of movies is hearing various interpretations from people who come at them with many different perspectives. What a load of shit. Clint Eastwood has made a rather meditative little movie that gives us some things to chew on. So I guess all I can really say in conclusion is to go watch Gran Torino for yourself and see what you get out of it. Thank you. Get off my lawn. Now it's time to lighten things up a bit with a movie that serves up its own special brand of homemade justice from a guy who has no home in the 2011 Splatterfest, Hobo with a Shotgun. A long time ago, I was one of you. They're all brand new and perfect. People look at you and think of how wonderful your future will be. They want you to be something special. I hate to tell you this, but if you grow up here, you're more likely to wind up selling your bodies on the streets. They're shooting dope from dirty needles in a bus stop. And if you're successful, 
You make money selling junk to crackheads. Maybe. Are you not like me? A hobo with a shotgun. Dutch character actor Rudger Hauer stars as a nameless drifter who has just arrived in the disgustingly corrupt and ironically named city of Hopetown. Chaos grips these twisted streets, the very streets this hobo now calls his home, and quickly realizing this town is in dire need of a good cleansing, he loads up his newly found shotgun and goes on a city-wide purge, knocking off criminal scum left and right. Once the word starts spreading about the fearless actions of this crazed vigilante, the city's most ruthless crime boss takes it upon himself and his pair of sadomasochistic sons to bring down this hobo with a shotgun before he can successfully bring any hope back to Hopetown. In 2007, acclaimed directors Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino joined forces on Grindhouse, an explosive, blood-soaked double feature that emulated the look and feel of grisly, low-budget 70s-era exploitation cinema. This epic two-part experience wasn't the huge box office hit as originally anticipated, but quickly gained a passionate cult following. Leading up to the film's release, an international promotional contest was held where amateur filmmakers could submit their own fake movie trailers for non-existent 70s, 80s era exploitation type films, and the winner would have their own trailer played alongside others, directed by the likes of Rob Zombie, Edgar Wright, Eli Roth, and Robert Rodriguez himself all of which were created solely for the Grindhouse double feature. The massive popularity of these fake trailers, particularly the Robert Rodriguez-directed Machete trailer starring Danny Trejo, eventually led to the creation of the Machete film franchise. The winning entry, which was submitted by Canadian filmmaker Jason Eisner, was a trailer for a violently over-the-top vigilante film outrageously titled Hobo with a Shotgun. Once the trailer proved to be a crowd pleaser following the release of Grindhouse, an actual feature-length film version soon went into production, and to play the title character, director Jason Eisner chose Rudger Hauer, whom you might recognize from movies like Blade Runner and Batman Begins. Filmed entirely in Canada during 2010, Eisner's Hobo with a Shotgun ended up capturing the feel of an old Grindhouse movie just as well, I think, as the Rodriguez Tarantino double feature did, although, instead of feeling like an exploitation film from the 70s, it felt more like something straight out of the 80s. A low-budget action horror gore fest filled with drug-addled insanity, leather-clad punks, and sunglass-wearing maniacs dressed like they stepped right out of a John Hughes teen movie. The film's impressive commitment to an 80s aesthetic is felt all over the place with its inclusion of old arcade machines, camcorders, and phone booths, and virtually all of the relentless gore and carnage is created using practical makeup effects. The entire film is drenched in overly saturated, almost neon colors, which makes it feel as much like an underground 80s comic book as it does an 80s movie. And speaking of 80s comics, the hobo with a shotgun premise made me think back to Frank Miller's acclaimed 1986 graphic novel, The Dark Knight Returns, where in a not-too-distant future, a 55-year-old Batman comes out of retirement to take back Gotham City, which is being ravaged by a gang of vile mutant punks. This very grizzled version of Batman, along with a new female Robin as his sidekick, has no qualms with using excessive force to exterminate the city's criminal element. And just as Batman's long-awaited return inspires others to fight with him, the war on crime brought on by the hobo and his prostitute sidekick instills a confidence in the people of Hopetown to band together and take back their city from the dangerous crime boss, who, by the way, dresses in a stylish white suit, much like how the Joker does in this particular story. Like Bill Foster in Falling Down, the hobo becomes highly distressed by simply looking around and seeing nothing but pandemonium happening right under his nose. So he decides to go on what could very well be a suicide mission to rid the city of such behavior. Like Falling Down and all these other movies, Hobo with a Shotgun wouldn't be quite what it is without its leading man. As confident the film is in its style and direction, it's Rudger Hauer's surprisingly earnest and heartfelt performance that turns this experiment and schlock into something much more. If you enjoyed Grindhouse, then I'd easily put this movie right alongside it due to its gleefully gratuitous violence and outlandish premise. Hobo with a Shotgun may be sparse on any deep social commentary, but that's probably because it's too busy oozing blood, guts, and good old-fashioned fun. You and me are going on a car ride to hell. You're riding shotgun.
Now, with the endless barrage of big-budget comic book movies released these days, it was inevitable that we'd see an offbeat response to the trend, and in 2011 we got just that, with Rain Wilson transforming himself into a savage superhero in the independent dark comedy, Super. Are you really into this Christy shit? I've never read it before. Oh, dude. God, I gotta warn you that this is pretty fucking stupid. Can I just buy it? Listen, I'm no different from you or anyone else, Holly. All it takes to be a superhero is the choice to fight evil. Actually, the guy's kind of got a point. I mean, I wonder all the time why no one's ever just stood up and become a real superhero. Now, you're probably screaming at me or something right now because of my failing to mention Kick-Ass as the prime send-up of the current superhero fad. Look, I enjoy Kick-Ass, and in the beginning, it did feel like that satirical answer to the oversaturation of comic book movies, even having been based on a comic book series itself. Superhero comic books do exist in the world of Kick-Ass, so this movie was shaping up to be a more realistic and comedic look at how being a fan of comics could make one want to become a superhero, but with more real-world consequences. Then added to the mix, you have Nicolas Cage in one of his few good roles as an experienced Batman-like vigilante and his expertly trained daughter, played by the scene-stealing Chloe Moretz. The film's extreme violence is there to remind us that this is supposed to take place in the real world, but it's the violence and the language that become the only two things that make Kick-Ass any different from all the other superhero movies. And that's because these two characters are basically so perfect at what they do that they might as well have superpowers. Not only do they practically steal the film from the title character, but their inclusion turns it into all of the other superhero movies I figured Kick-Ass was supposed to be making fun of and commenting on. Some people say that's the point, I, for one, wasn't really crazy about that direction. Again, despite my gripes, Kick-Ass was fine. But I'd say its strengths lie in its colorful cinematography and stunning action sequences. <sighs> okay, now with that out of the way... Along came this smaller, lesser-known film called Super, which stars Rain Wilson as a delusional short-order cook named Frank Darbo, who's inspired to become a crime fighter after his wife, played by Liv Tyler, runs off with a fast-talking drug dealer played by the Baconator. While seeking out advice on how being a superhero works, he befriends a young comic book store employee played by Ellen Page, and reluctantly allows her to become his sidekick. Now donning a custom-made red costume and calling himself the Crimson Bolt, Darbo stalks the streets and makes the headlines as he seeks out evildoers and tries to rescue his estranged wife. Shut up, crime! It may look like a superhero film on the surface, but Frank Darbo's fractured sense of heroism actually makes him surprisingly reminiscent of Bill Foster, Travis Bickle, or the hobo with a shotgun. The biggest difference being that Darbo decides to go about his mission while wearing a colorful comic book inspired outfit. Also, mainly due to the extremely low budget, the movie doesn't try to choreograph any huge elaborate action set pieces like every other superhero movie does. But hey, who made it a rule that every superhero movie had to have them? There aren't really any true action sequences in the traditional sense, but the movie doesn't shy away from giving us some unsettling flashes of brutal violence that writer and director James Gunn pulls off effectively coming from a horror movie background. While people tend to look at Kick-Ass as the renegade superhero film, I think Super sets itself up to be a much more unpredictable watch, and with its limited budget, a lot of it feels very down-to-earth. Well, outside of one really strange dream sequence. I think people who are aware of Super call it a kick-ass ripoff, but what you learn from the Blu-ray's audio commentary is that James Gunn actually wrote the initial script for Super years before the original kick-ass comics were ever published. It's just that it took nearly a decade for the movie to get financed. Rain Wilson plays a great borderline psychotic hero. Just don't expect him to be simply playing it as Dwight from The Office in a red jumpsuit. Wilson plays him as a very sad, withdrawn character, and the sadness seems to be what leads to the unbridled anger that pushes him to becoming a confrontational, at times inept, vigilante. Wilson gives a strong, passionate performance as a guy who hasn't had many shining moments in his life, so when he's actually driven to become a masked superhero, it's like for the first time ever, he finally feels comfortable in his own skin. But that doesn't necessarily mean he always makes the best decisions when picking fights with jerks and criminals. I think writer and director James Gunn has successfully crafted a dark, edgy, funny, and at times sad character study that disguises itself as a superhero action comedy. And because there are so many bizarre moments, it took me a second viewing for me to fully appreciate what it was doing. 
Even though Super does show its budgetary limitations here and there, I think it proves that Gunn has a unique perspective on superheroes, which is why I'm highly looking forward to seeing what he brings to the table next summer as the writer and director of Marvel Studios' Guardians of the Galaxy, an unusual superhero team that's being brought to the big screen by an unusual filmmaker. So in preparation for Guardians of the Galaxy, I highly recommend checking out Super. That is, if you're in the mood for a quirky vigilante superhero movie that hits you like a giant cement block. The final film on our blood-spattered list continues down a similar darkly comedic path as stand-up comic, actor, writer, and director Bobcat Goldthwait shoves a foot right up pop culture's ass in the 2011 satire, God Bless America. I hate my neighbors. The constant cacophony of stupidity that pours from their apartment is absolutely soul-crushing. You know what? And I looked him right in the eye. I go, you're retarded. And then I punched him right in the face. It doesn't matter how politely I ask them to practice some common courtesy. They're incapable of comprehending that their actions affect other people. They have a complete lack of consideration for anyone else and an overly developed sense of entitlement. They have no decency, no concern, no shame. They do not care that I suffer from debilitating migraines and insomnia. They do not care that I have to go to work or that I want to kill them. Bill Murray's younger brother Joel stars as Frank Murdoch, a lonely middle-aged divorcee who, in just one day, gets fired from his office job for no good reason and is given a diagnosis of terminal cancer. If that wasn't enough, his ex-wife and daughter couldn't care less about him, he's got exceedingly loud and irritating neighbors, and whenever he turns on his TV, it's littered with trashy gossip shows, despicable reality TV stars, and rude, no-talent celebrities that are treated as royalty. Yeah, not the best of days. That night, after catching about five minutes of a program similar to MTV's My Super Sweet 16, a depressed Frank takes the gun out of his mouth and sets off to use it on the spoiled teenage girl featured in the episode. So, only a little over 30 minutes into the film, he actually finds her. And he kills her. One of the girl's classmates, Roxy, who witnesses the murder, instantly becomes fascinated with Frank and convinces him to go kill the wealthy parents of the spoiled teenage reality star, which they do. Too late to turn back now, Frank hesitantly allows the sadistically energetic Roxy to join him on a Bonnie and Clyde-style killing spree. Now, this unlikely pair is branching out from hunting worthless reality TV stars. They've made it their mission to rid the world of anyone who's, well, an asshole. Once famous for his recognizably screechy voice, his outlaw brand of stand-up comedy, and being a featured player in the long-running Police Academy franchise, Bobcat Goldthwait has spent more time in recent years behind the camera as a filmmaker, and a pretty good one at that. His growing filmography thus far has included some pretty dark but honest comedy that isn't afraid to tackle some pretty taboo subject matter. I personally find Goldthwait's movies to be quite funny, which I've already covered in my review of his 2009 black comedy, World's Greatest Dad, starring Robin Williams, an overlooked little gem in my opinion. Goldthwait clearly didn't hold anything back when he wrote the script for God Bless America. Aside from some rather shocking imagery, the movie is brimming with sardonic rants against the atrocious television programming and media that's rammed down our throats on a daily basis, and Joel Murray's character sees it as a prominent source of the contemptible behavior in today's society. I won't participate in watching a show where the weak are torn apart every week for our entertainment. Everything is so cruel now. I just want it all to stop. Murray brings to the film a wonderfully grounded and multi-layered lead performance that can be both sad and funny at the same time. His laid-back, deadpan delivery does remind you a bit of his brother Bill, and it perfectly contrasts the perverse, hyperactive enthusiasm Tara Lynn Barr brings to Frank's teenage sidekick, Roxy. Frank. What? This is more fun than killing yourself, right? I don't know. Yeah, I guess. Now, if I were to have anything critical to say about this movie, it would probably be that Joel Murray's long-winded monologues and much of the additional dialogue really just sounds like Bobcat Goldthwait has a lot to get off his chest, even though he admits writing the script wasn't just some way of venting his own frustrations. But, in a way, I don't really want to criticize this because, to be quite honest, I find myself actually agreeing with Joel Murray's character a fair amount of the time. I certainly don't agree with his actions, but I think many of his cultural diatribes hit the nail right on the head. You don't watch it, but you saw him. Yeah. Right, what, are you too good for the show? Yeah. 
I'm too good for a karaoke contest that makes stars out of people with no talent. Oh, you can't say that, dude. Some of those kids have real talent. No, they don't. They have good pitch. They're relatively clean. They're non-threatening to little girls and old ladies. They have the ability to stand in line with a stadium full of other desperate and confused people. But I assure you, they are talent free. Obviously, the movie is a dark satire where the basis of the humor stems from the idea that a guy goes around murdering a lot of people simply because they aren't very nice. I get the joke, but not everybody does, which I can understand. I love the fact that people compare the movie to Falling Down a lot, or the Michael Douglas, but I, I think the big difference between this movie and that movie is you're not watching it going, it's just Michael Douglas with a bad haircut. <laughs> I'm, I'm obscure enough that you're not thinking, oh, that's Joel Murray. I think, uh, you know, Falling Down is funny, is an example of a movie where, where uh, he's going to kill a guy, so we find out the guy's a Nazi and a racist, so then you, you feel okay with him killing the guy. God Bless America struck a personal chord with me, mainly because of how on point it is about the irritations that come with living in this modern era of constant media bombardment. I mean, nobody talks about anything anymore. They just regurgitate everything they see on TV or hear on the radio or, or watch on the web. When was the last time you had a real conversation with someone without somebody texting or looking at a screen or a monitor over your head? You know, a, a conversation about something that wasn't uh, celebrities, gossip, sports, or pop politics. Frank Murdoch begins his murderous quest because he can't tolerate reality TV or how our culture grossly obsesses over these so-called celebrities. Now you could say that many of Frank's problems would be solved just by simply turning off his TV set, but he's forced to blast the volume in order to drown out the incessant bickering of his annoying next door neighbors. Plus, no matter how hard he tries, the guy just can't get away from this stuff. Whether he's merely turning on his car radio and catching moments of a mean-spirited morning talk show, or overhearing his fellow co-workers loudly riffing on American Idol contestants. And as ridiculously overblown the movie portrays these different types of TV shows and arrogant media figures, you soon realize that it isn't too far off. Now, it may exaggerate some things to get some points across, but sadly, I think it's pretty accurate in how it handles the endless stream of garbage millions of Americans just can't seem to get enough of. As someone who's sick and tired of all this crap as much as Frank Murdoch is, I hereby declare that God Bless America is one hell of a sick and twisted joyride. You really gotta take both those spots? This time yeah. We'll look at the Fuck you. Fuck you. <sighs> that was intense. I mean, I'm whooped. Are you whooped? Because I'm pretty whooped. I mean, I, I'm out of breath. My head hurts from all this thinking. This has never happened to me before. Well, I guess after that kind of in-depth discussion, I'm going to need a little fresh air. Well, I want to take this time to thank the few of you who have stuck around with me on this one. Just please do me a favor and make this all worth it by checking out Falling Down. And if you have a little extra time on your hands, take a look at some of my other recommendations from this episode as well. Oh, and don't forget, you can find more episodes of the DVD Shelf Movie Reviews just by heading on over to happydragonpictures.com. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going on vacation. So, aloha oi until we meet again. But for now, this one's going back on the DVD Shelf. Excuse me. Excuse me. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but there's other people waiting to use the phone here. There are? Yeah. Other people want to use the phone. That's right, you selfish asshole. Jeez, that's too bad, because you know what? What? I think it's out of order. <laughs>